Welcome to another episode of Field Phone Ops. Today, we're going to discuss the U.S. Army Telephone TP9, otherwise known as a TA-264-PT. So sit back and learn something. And this is a TP9. These are developed in the uh, early 40s during World War II to solve a problem that they had with uh, the range of field telephones over field wire. Um, the range was finite. It wasn't exact science. So, you know, you can go 10 miles all the time or 12 miles. There were deciding factors in the environment that caused problems. So the solution was to put what's called a repeater in. So basically if you had a link that was, say, 10 miles long and that's as far as you could go, you would put a repeater in midway at 5 miles and you'd be able to use your normal field phones. The problem with this was, in reality, in a combat situation in the field, are you going to be able to put these telephone repeater boxes out there uh, were battery powered, they had to have guys change the batteries, um, they required adjusting on occasion, so you were constantly having a team of signal and wire guys going around adjusting these. So the solution was, well, why don't we build a telephone that is amplified and can replace these repeaters because it has the application in it? And this is what we got right here. And this is it, it it's, it's very heavy, it weighs about 20 pounds right here. Uh, that's without putting the batteries in it. It's basically a, a solid aluminum case, it's got the hand crank here, generator on the side, carry strap. It's built this big because the upper compartment, will open it up, the upper compartment has the telephone and handset and all the controls and the lower compartment contains the amplifier which consists of vacuum tubes and the batteries to run them. That's why it's so large. But basically it was designed to be used in two modes. It could be used in a normal uh, field phone mode where it could talk to other field phones not amplified and it had an amplification mode that you could cut into and turn on if you needed to do so. Um, like I said, uh, a case with a hinge cover on it, it's weatherproof, I wouldn't say it's waterproof, there's a gasket between this top piece and this bottom piece to keep water out of the electronics, the top I don't think is that really waterproof. Um, a little bit about the different parts, just the handset cradle right here, the handset would sit in basically like this and rest in there. Um, connector for the handset, it also had three holes plugged on the side so you could plug in one of the chest rigs like they used during World War II for hands-free work. Binding post where you connect your field wire at. This is actually a visual indicator you can select either uh, by this switch right here, either a bell or uh, that signal there to show an incoming call, not both. The uh, ringing bell has no volume adjustment. It's either on or off. And this right here is actually controlled the electronics person. This controlled the gain, which basically was the received audio signal you're getting into the amplifier. So this basically turned the volume up and down on a handset. The handset itself used the regular uh, same one as an ED8 had. Push the talk right there, the butterfly switch. Um, it had detailed instructions right here on top. I'm not going to zoom in on this. That explained how to set up an operator. And what made this thing really crazy is because it used vacuum tubes, it took five batteries to run this. It took uh, a 1.5 volt battery, which is rather large because it had to put a lot, a lot of amperage to provide what's called filament voltage, which was part of the, what was needed for the vacuum tubes. Then it had three 22 and a half volt batteries that provided the actual uh, what's called plate voltage to make the tubes operate. And it had a, a four and a half volt battery in it that provided the normal talk battery when you're using it in normal field phone mode. Um, the batteries, they fit inside. We'll get into it later after we, after we make some calls to open it up. The batteries fit in the bottom. And like I said, this weighs about 20 pounds right now without batteries. And I can see filling that battery compartment up would put this at probably, I mean, probably 25 pounds or heavier. So it wasn't a light thing to carry around. So these weren't really fielded to units to take out to the front lines and put in foxholes. They're usually used towards the rear in the headquarters companies. And basically uh, what they would do is they'd operate it as a normal, normal phone call. And uh, when you got an incoming call, you would answer it, and they would tell you, hey, I have a call on the other end. It's a guy calling from so-and-so. He's on a, another TP9. Now, one of the issues with this is they would only work with themselves. So if you had a TP9 on this end, you had to have a TP9 on the other end. And that's how they work. So they would tell you that, hey, you've got an amplified phone call. What you would do then is push this button right here, and this plunger would come up. 
that puts the phone in amplified mode. Then you would go ahead and adjust your volume and gain right here using this button to get it to where you want the sound and have a good signature. The other problem with this is unlike phones we have nowadays is if both ends talked at the same time, they would cause uh, oscillations and garbling and you get the woo 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 and all those crazy electronic sounds you see from the 50s and 60s movies and that. And uh, it would continue back and forth as long as both parties were talking. So one party had to talk and stop and indicate they were stopping by saying break or something along those lines. Then the other end could talk. And basically it was like using a radio. That's how it worked. And the book says, for some reason, if you're talking, the other end starts talking and get that, that warbling sound going, oscillation going on, you're supposed to send them a real quick ring like that to tell them, hey, stop talking. And that's how it worked. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, I'll hook it up with the, uh, the EE-8. Um, the, like I said, these were used, uh, they came out in, uh, I think it was 43 is when they first came out, and they were used into the 60s. In, uh, in the 1950s, they actually changed the nomenclature on them from... Uh, TP9 to TA264, which is about the same time they changed, they can't use the TA designation for a fuel phone. So that's what it is. And they continue to use them. Um, like I said, they were not made for use in foxholes, usually in a more secure environment. This particular unit itself is actually made for the Navy. It's got a little sticker on the front right here. You can see a little their stamp, U.S. Navy. Um, the Army models generally have TP9 and all the stuff put in the front of it right there. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and uh, shut it down and uh, we'll go ahead and hook an EE-8 up to it, which is the phone it was used with, and we'll make some phone calls. Okay, I have it hooked up to my uh, trusty EE-8, which would be one of the phones it would be used with in this time period. I'll go ahead and get it out and I'll show you that the EE-8 handset right here, same handset that this used. This one's a little bit newer and a little bit better shape. Put it back on there. Uh, first thing I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll make a phone call from the E8 to the TP9 to see how it works. We have it set in signal mode, so it should drop the little indicator. Here we go. There you go. See the indicator drop right there. You then answer the call and uh, proceed as you normally would using the, the PTT on it right there. Go ahead and reset that. I'll switch it to ring and we'll ring it. Here we go. Fairly, fairly loud ring. I mean, it's easily heard. There's no way to adjust the volume, like I said. And you would pick it up and test one, two, test one, two, three. So you see it works both ways. Now, the interesting part about this is if you were to receive a phone call like that and you were talking, and the operator called you and said, "Hey, uh, I've got an amplified phone call for you," you would pick your phone up and then you would do the thing right here. Push the button, it'll pop up. You're now in amplified mode. You finish your phone call, hang it back up. And go ahead and I'll seal that again. Okay, now we're going to call from this to this to the E8. Standard hand ringer. That's it. Uh, works in common battery mode only. Or excuse me, local battery mode. Local battery mode only. There's no provisions on this to put a dialer on or something. This was basically used... Uh, to go a longer distance, basically it doubled the distance. So if you had two EE8s hooked up and you were going, let's say, eight miles, and after eight miles it started sounding iffy, if you threw one of these on each end, you'd probably be able to get to about 16 or 17 miles. So that's what they're used for. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and shut down. I'll go ahead and I'll open it up and I'll show you the inside, which is even more interesting. Okay, now we'll go ahead and we'll talk a little bit about the batteries. This is what's unique in this phone. Um, it took five batteries. This is actually a, I took this out of the, the manual and basically cut and pasted it so we could have something we could talk about. Um, took five batteries. Uh, the large BA65, which is 1.5 volts, was used to provide what was called filament voltage for the tubes. The tubes had to have filament voltage to operate. Additionally, each of the three vacuum tubes had its own 22.5 volt battery here, shown as these BA2s. These provided what's called uh, plate voltage to make each tube work. Then there was a separate BA27, so the, the, the rectangular one on top, that was 4.5 volts. And this basically was the battery to power the talking portion of it when you were operating the amplifiers. 
And that would be the same as putting uh, two D-cell batteries in a TA-312 or an EE-8. That's what that did. So as you can see, this is rather interesting. Uh, many of these batteries were common throughout uh, radio equipment, telephone equipment at this, this time period. So, so that's how it worked. Um, average lifespan on these batteries uh, was three to four weeks, depending on usage. And it was a chore to change them, as you can see in the next uh, video. Okay, I'm going to take it apart now. We'll show you where the battery compartment, all the, the guts of the electronics. There's four screws are on the outside that you loosen up. And you go ahead and you take this cover off. you got to get some extra strap here. And you'll pick it up like this. And you'll turn it over and you'll set it like this. I hope you can see it good. There we go. We'll slide everything around so you can see it better. And that's it. I'll go ahead and I'll even go one step further. Turn it like this. Okay, this is basically it. This whole thing right here is the battery compartment. Like I said, it was designed to hold three 22 and a half volt batteries, plus a big uh, one and a half volt battery, plus a 4.5 volt battery. So it's very large. Now, this is not modern day lithium batteries like we have now, so this is the big old dry cell batteries that it used. And those are all, this part is removable. I'm not going to take it out because it's difficult to get back in. And then it had these vacuum tube amplifiers. These two were used to amplify the incoming signal. So the signal you're getting from the other end would come into this first tube, get amplified, then get put into the second tube, and then forward to the handset so you could hear it. That's what your gain control, the actual received volume level coming off these amplifiers. This right here amplified your outgoing voice. So when you keyed your push to talk, it amplified that voice, sent it down the line. On the other end, same thing. You had two a two-stage amplifier using two tubes, to amplify the incoming voice and a single one sending it out. Then they also sent you this right here. This is a spare tube. Since these are basically the same tube, part number used in different applications, one spare tube. So you could change it right there. Um, average time for battery run on these, uh, according to the TO, was three to four weeks, depending on usage. It's not an easy task to replace batteries in this. I mean, you have to take this apart and pull this all apart, and there's individual. I'm, individual, actually a binding post on it with a whole bunch of terminals on it that you have to individually hook each battery wire to, so that's how it works. I'm debating right now whether I want to build a battery pack for this. It would probably cost $200 to get an actual battery pack. I can make myself, but I have to order the batteries to the specs that it will actually run this. Um, I don't know if that's worth seeing the tubes glow or not, but uh, since these work the best, and pretty much only with another one of these at the other end, I'd have to buy another one of these to talk back and forth, and I'd mean I'd have to build another battery pack to run an amplified mode. So I'm probably just going to keep running it like this. Uh, it's really neat on the inside. I can't really show any more, but it's before the days of RTV and silicon seal and all that stuff. So everything is varnished to waterproof it. There's actually a tag, you can't see it, it's inside the, the, the cover that's actually got a waterproofing date of, I think it was 1944, when they actually varnished and waterproofed it all. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed. This is a TP9 field foam. Thanks for watching.